Welcome to the recorded version of Navigating Senior Care Options, part of the Family Caregiver Support Webinar Series brought to you by the American Society on Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. All right, our presenter today is Lakeland Hogan. Lakeland is a gerontologist and caregiver advocate for Home Instead Senior Care. She works to educate professionals, families, and communities on issues older adults face. Lakeland is a doctoral candidate at the University of Nebraska Omaha, where she is studying social gerontology. She has a Master of Arts in Social Gerontology and a Master's in Business Administration from UNO. Lakeland has professional experience in the private and public sectors of senior care services. She has worked on special projects for UNO's Department of Gerontology and the local area agency on aging. Lakeland serves as Vice, Pre Vice President of the Board of Directors for the Dreamweaver Foundation and is active in the Alzheimer's Association's Walk to End Alzheimer's. Lakeland has a passion for helping others, especially aging adults and their families. And with that, I would like to turn the floor over to our presenter today, Lakeland Hogan. Thanks for being here, Lakeland. Thank you so much, Steve. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining me. We will be talking about navigating senior care options in today's hour. And we're fortunate to live in a day and age where there are a variety of options for families and older adults to choose from as we age. And this can be a bit of a blessing and a curse because it can be confusing and frustrating at times. And sometimes it's overwhelming for families when there are all of these choices. So it's our job as professionals to help families navigate all of these options. So as professionals, we can educate ourselves so that we in turn can help these families. So my hope is that um, you'll learn about the different care options throughout the care continuum as we go through today's webinar. And that, in fact, is the first objective of today's uh, of today's webinar, I am going to go over the care continuum and talk in detail about each of the different types of care. And then we're going to talk about how to understand what type of care is best for the older adult and when it might be time to transition to an, a different type of care. Then we're also going to look at the questions and considerations that an older adult and their family uh, need to consider when choosing a care option. And then we're going to talk about the cost of care and options for financing. That's always a big topic. Um, so before we dive into all of that, um, I wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about our role as professionals in helping families navigate this complicated care continuum. Older adults and their families look to us to assist them in navigating these care options, and they expect us to know about the different options of care. So we need to be educated on the care continuum and the options specific to our local communities. Another important part of our role is making good referrals, and this really is key. Vague referrals can be frustrating to families, especially referrals where we aren't able to give them a specific name, phone number, or direct contact. And in order to provide this information, we need to keep our referral records up to date so that we can give the most accurate information. And something else we need to keep in mind is that we want to tell older adults and their families what to expect when they do contact the referral that we give them. Families can be discouraged when they get a referral because they may not have accurate expectations about what they can get from this source and their needs ultimately go unmet. So if you're familiar with the services provided, you can explain to that family. Uh, it, you might be able to explain the organizational intake process or steps for getting started on that type of care or give them an idea of what types of services that referral provider can uh, provide for, those, for that older adult and their family. And it's important to give families choices if possible, and it's important to give an unbiased referral. We may not understand the full picture of an, of an older adult situation, so we want to avoid assuming that families can or cannot afford services or that they would want to move versus staying at home or vi vice versa. So having that unbiased approach can help give the family several different options in terms of a referral. And then I also understand that some organizations have certain policies that regulate their referral process. So you might be thinking, my hands are kind of tied when it comes to the referral process. However, if we're handing families a list of maybe 20 providers and saying, here you go, 
good luck, it can really be overwhelming. So if we can be educated on the providers and have the most up-to-date information, we can hopefully help narrow that list down to hopefully four or five providers that can more accurately meet their needs. So another important part of our role as professionals in the, in the uh, older in the field of helping older adults, is to foster good communication. When working with older adults and their families, unfortunately, more likely than not, they are in a crisis mode. It would be great if all the families that we worked with had had these conversations as the older adult was aging and had an aging plan, but many of you are probably thinking, yeah, right, <laughs> that's not usually the case. So when, we, when these older adults and their families get to us as professionals, they are in a crisis mode. So we need to be very empathetic to their situation and try to put ourselves in their shoes. We also need to be good listeners and seek first to understand the situation and understand the older adult's wants and needs. And it's important to help the older adult determine what their goals for care are and also help to understand what the family's capacity to care is, because so often families are involved in the care of an older adult, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. And this could help us to then determine where the true need lies and what type of referral or care option will be best suited for the situation. We also want to encourage a team approach by including the older adult and their family members in these conversations. If the older adult's involved in the conversation, they'll feel like part of the solution and hopefully be more willing to agree with the care solution that is decided upon. And we also want to remain positive and use proactive language. For older adults, they might be focused on limitations. For example, if they're recently hospitalized, they might be focused on their new dietary restrictions or the fact that they're going home with a walker. But if we can reframe these limitations in a more positive way, it can really turn the conversation around. For example, the walker will help you move safely around the house and avoid falls so you can avoid coming back to the hospital. Or these dietary restrictions will really help you feel better overall. Again, try to reframe, stay positive. Use that proactive language. And to sum this all up, you could use this simple acronym when communicating with families. And if you've tuned into my webinars, you've probably seen this before. But it's ACT. So first, you want to assess the situation. So you want to listen to the older adult and their family to collect as much information as possible. Then you want to consider the options for care. It might be staying home with services brought into the home, or it might be moving to a community setting. Then you want to talk through the options to see what makes the most sense. You might want to talk through a plan A, one that's really ideal uh, and really aligns with the goals of the older adult, and then talk through possibly a plan B. What if we can't get to a plan A? What would be your second preference? And again, include the older adult in these conversations along the way. So we always want to assess the situation, consider all the options, and then talk to them thoroughly to reach a solution that's best for everyone involved. So I've been talking a lot about the referral process and helping families navigate this complicated continuum of care. So let's dive more into that continuum here on the next slide. The continuum of care covers a variety of services that are available to meet the diverse care needs of the older adult population. Some older adults will move all the way through the continuum, while others may only need a few of the services. And these services do not necessarily have to be used in the order that I have listed here on the slides. However, the way I have listed them out, uh, the care generally increases in intensity or assistance along the way. So this first slide covers the types of care that are typically utilized when an older adult is living at home or in a residential setting. Aging in place, of course, is an option in a continuum of care. And to do so, they might have family members, I talked about this a little earlier, family care to help them stay at home. They might visit senior centers or go to an adult care center. They might bring in home care or home health care. And of course, um, 
Again, these services are ones that are typically brought into a home setting, but they could also, uh, especially the last two, home care and home health care, could be brought into a facility setting if an older adult choose to move from the home. So let's look at options for community living within the continuum of care here on the next slide. So some, like I just mentioned, some adults might, older adults might make the transition from a home setting to a community setting. They might reside in a retirement or independent living community. They might be in an assisted living community or skilled nursing home, which is sometimes referred to or, uh, as a skilled nursing facility. And then finally, towards the end of the life of an older adult, they might enlist the services of hospice. And this can be done at home or in a facility or community setting. Now we're going to dive deeper into each of these topics. So I know I kind of went through them quickly, but I wanted to show you the broad spectrum of the continuum of care before we dive into each of these more deeply. And I mentioned earlier, not all families have planned for this continuum of care, and they might not be aware of all of the options. So let's talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. A challenging part of our job can be the fact that families have not planned for their loved one's future care needs. In fact, 73% of adult children have neither planned nor thought about their care of their older loved one. And only about half of older adults have planned or thought about developing a care plan for themselves. So when the time comes and the older adult is in need of care, they're really looking to us as experts for guidance on the types of care that are available in their community and guidance on the type of care that they will need. And I'm sure many of you have encountered when talking with older adults about their care preferences, the majority of them would prefer to age in place. And again, that was the first of the care continuum that we looked at in the previous slides. So let's talk a little bit more about aging in place. You may or may not be surprised to learn that 90% of Americans over the age of 65 want to stay at home and 80% of them think that home is where they will always live. And if you think about it, for many older adults, home is where they've raised their children, where their grandkids have played, where they know their neighbors, where they can easily navigate the local grocery store, pharmacy, maybe their church or faith-based community is nearby. And more often than not, they don't want to leave those comforts of home and all that home represents to them. But the reality is, most homes were not built specifically for aging in place. So let's talk a little bit more about how we can modify the home in order to ensure successful aging in place. So in order to maintain the older adult safety, the home will need to be adapted and some adaptations will need to be made to various parts of the house. And these can be small fixes such as grab bars, toilet seat risers, maybe adding some additional lighting. It could be uh, on the other extreme where they redo a bathroom from a tub to a walk-in shower or add a wheelchair ramp for easy access into the home. And now these fixes help to minimize the risks such as falls, fires, and so forth. Another key component to aging in place is to bring in outside help when needed. And that could be um, family care that we'll talk about in just a minute, or it could be professionals. And these could include things as, such as lawn care, housework, um, preparing meals, providing transportation, and so forth. And for a lot of older adults, family plays a big part in helping them age in place and providing uh, these types of needed tasks and services. We're going to look at family care here next. According to the National Alliance for Caregiving, in the U.S. there are over 36 million family caregivers providing care to older adults, and about 80% of them are spouses or adult children. And I'm sure you commonly work with those two categories of family caregivers, those spouses and those adult children. But however, due to a decreasing family size, there are fewer family caregivers that are available to provide care to older adults and that's only going to continue to shrink in numbers. So today, there are about five family caregivers to every one older adult. 
but that number by 2050 is expected to decrease to four family caregivers to every one adult. So that's almost half of the number of family caregivers we have now. So as the availability of the family caregivers continue to decline, older adults might have to look to other resources in order to age in place. But there are also another factor that plays into this is the growing distance that is occurring between family members. On average, we find that one or more adult children live more than 280 miles from their aging parent. So distance creates some additional challenges for caregiving. It might put the strain or stress on the family caregiver that's more local to the older adult, or might create communication issues. So lots of things to consider, especially uh, when there are multiple adult children or family members involved in the care. So I did include some questions here on the slide that we can encourage families to discuss when they're looking to their family members to provide that care that's needed to help them age in place. So would they want to consider who is available to provide care? How much time do they have? Are they close enough? Uh, do they have financial resources? And will they feel comfortable providing these types of care? So lots of different factors. And we're finding also that more family caregivers, especially the adult children category, they are working and have a family of their own. So that puts a whole nother dynamic and a whole nother set of stressors on the family, uh, family caregivers when providing care to their older adult loved one. So there are several types of care that family can use to supplement this family care. So we're going to talk more about those on the next slide. So they can bring uh, services into the home or they can take a loved one uh, to a senior center or adult care center to uh, help to supplement that family care. And we're going to talk more about those centers here on the next slide. Senior centers and adult care centers provide a variety of services. Senior centers are, more, are typically geared more towards active adults, older adults. There are about uh, 11,400 senior centers in the U.S., and they serve over 1 million older adults. It's a great, uh, a great way to find out about the senior centers in your loved one's area is to contact your local area agency on aging. They usually can provide you with a list of senior centers in the community. And these centers primarily provide social and recreational services. And many also provide a congregate or group meal. Older adults must generally be in good mental and physical health to attend these senior centers, and some programs even offer transportation services to and from the senior center if an older adult is limited in their uh, ability to drive to and from. Now, when it comes to adult day centers, sometimes re referred to as adult day care, often provide a higher level of care and supervision. There are about 4,800 of these centers in the U.S., and they provide supervised social and recreational services. Many also provide meals, they administer medications, and even offer some personal care services. And again, these are generally for older adults, um, and especially those with age-associated disabilities. And it is common for individuals living with Alzheimer's to attend adult day centers, especially if they cannot be left alone at home. So family members will opt to bring them to these adult care centers uh, for a portion of the day, whether it's while they're at work or to provide that family caregiver a little bit of respite. So these are some nice options. Uh, older adults able to stay at home, but still get out and socialize, engage in activities, and even um, be provided a meal at these types of centers. Another service that can supplement the family care is home care that can be brought into the home. Home care is a service that helps to keep older adults safe and independent at home, and where, that would be wherever home is. So it could be um, in a residential setting or in one of the community settings that we'll talk about in a little bit. But ultimately, it helps to meet the desire of older adults to stay at home. And home care can often be customized to meet the needs of older adults and their family care partners. Services include uh, the ones that you see there on the slide, primarily the, 
the ADLs and IADLs, so the activities of daily living and the instrumental activities of daily living. So making sure that the older adult is eating regular meals, helping to tidy up the home, provided, providing that needed companionship socialization. They can remind them to take medications. They can make sure that they get to different appointments, such as doctor's appointments, hair appointment, that sort of thing. They can help run errands and help with shopping. They can also provide some personal care, such as bathing, grooming, restroom assistance, and so forth. And there are a variety of home care providers out there, so it's important for families to do research on quality care providers in the local community. And in turn, it's important as professionals to also do our research so we can make referrals to reputable uh, organizations in our community that provide these home care services. And oftentimes, the older adults will have more medically-based needs. And this is where home health care can be brought in to assist. Home health care, or skilled care at home, is most commonly ordered by a clinician after a debilitating event or hospital stay. So some examples. Home health could be brought in for physical and occupational therapy after an older adult has a stroke. Or it could be ordered uh, to visit the patient at home to check on vital signs after a heart attack. It could also be um, providing a bath aid to an individual who has a broken hip and has some difficulty getting in and out of the shower to bathe regularly. So uh, these services are primarily medical in nature and very task-based. So the home health uh, professional will come into the home to change a wound dressing or to provide physical therapy. However, they're not there to make a meal or do the laundry. So that's why oftentimes families will pair this medical home health care with the non-medical home care to provide for all of the older adults' needs and making sure that they are safe and independent at home. And again, these home health services are most commonly ordered by a doctor or clinician, uh, and especially in order to be covered by Medicare. And these services are temporarily for, are usually for a temporary or shorter period of time until the older adult has recovered or um, the wound is healed, that sort of thing. So we've talked about a lot of different services that can help keep older adults at home. But what about the options for older adults who transition out of the home? So we're going to talk in more depth about those living options here on the next slide. So the next um, kind of level of care, the level in the care continuum, would be a retirement or independent living community. And these are certainly more readily available in local communi communities across the nation than they were even just a decade ago. And there's a variety of models of independent living, and they could range from a subdivision of houses, maybe they're all a ranch-style house that are, um, are easily um, navigated through, meaning they don't have stairs or they have a zero entry from the garage up into uh, the living quarters, that sort of thing. It could also be a complex of condos or 55 plus apartment buildings or independent living facilities that are like a apartment complex but have communal space for things such as meals or activities. And there are certainly advantages to living in these independent living facilities or communities. The older adult, of course, is still living independently, and it also can provide a level of security. There might be um, additional security, such as uh, being part of a gated community or having a gated entrance. There might be a staff member there 24-7, those types of things. And like I mentioned, some independent communities offer um, group meals or congregate meals. They might also offer housekeeping, transportation, and activities. And so therefore, they offer a very social environment, which may be very appealing to some older adults. However, there are some things to consider. In independent living communities, oftentimes personal care services are not provided. So the older adult, as their needs progress, they might need to bring in outside help, whether it's family members or an agency, such as home care or home health. There's often no formal regulation, and this really kind of depends state to state, uh, so that's something to keep in mind. And sometimes they require a large upfront fee. 
And it's also important to consider that these costs of these independent living facilities really do vary by the real estate market and vary from state to state. When an older adult needs progress, uh, some will, again, remain in that independent community and bring in help, and others might transition to the next level of care, which is assisted living facilities. Assisted living facilities provide the same services as those independent communities, such as meals, housekeeping, socialization, and additionally, they provide personal care, medication administration, and so forth. These assisted living facilities are regulated, so therefore we know that there's over 30,000 uh, assisted living facilities in the U.S. with about 1 million licensed beds. So this is a growing area of this care continuum. And in these facilities, older adults still have the conveniences of home, typically a private or semi-private room. And this really maximizes their dignity while providing the needed support services. It can also provide an increased level of safety. Most of them are staffed 24-7 with, with, um, with oversight 24-7. And they can also continue to be social in these communities. There's a significant amount of choice in the activities, uh, in the meal choice, so they still have that independence and they can go about their daily lives pretty similarly to the way that they would do, do so at home. However, it's important to consider that these, again, facilities range in price. Some of them can be costly. And another thing to keep in mind is that the average resident stays in an assisted living for about two years and then is likely to move possibly to a skilled facility, skilled nursing facility. So it's important for families to find out about the assisted living guidelines around the care that they can and cannot provide. And it's important to become educated on the policies so we understand when this facility might not be able to provide for the care needs any longer and would refer them on to a higher level of care. Which brings us to a, a discussion about skilled nursing facilities. So skilled nursing facilities, sometimes you hear them referred to as a SNF, the S-N-F, it's the abbreviation, or some people refer to them as nursing homes. And when talking to an older adult, many of them desire to avoid nursing home stays. However, it might be necessary to provide the level of care that the older adult needs. And these um, skilled nursing facilities are staffed with doctors, psychiatrists, registered uh, dietitians, practicing nurses. And sometimes older adults will have a short stay in one of these facilities, perhaps after they are transitioning out of a hospital setting, or they might go for re rehabilitation services and others might have a longer stay due to frailty and the need to be monitored around the clock. And because this type of facility is providing such a high level of care, they are also highly regulated. So some advantages are, again, that around-the-clock supervision and care. They're also um, a sense of community. They provide those meals and activities. And there's also a reduced risk at a nursing home because of this around-the-clock staff and regular evaluations. However, a skilled nursing facility might be very expensive, especially if an older adult uh, without like a long-term care policy or uh, if they do not have the funds to sustain their stay. There's also a high rate of loneliness in nursing homes. Oftentimes, families are less likely to visit there, uh, which can lead to depression and isolation. And sometimes these facilities can lack privacy and limit an older adult's independence and choice. So these are all things to consider when, uh, when talking about this part of the care continuum. And while skilled nursing facilities have the highest level of care, apart from a hospital, of course, um, hospice might be brought in at the end of life if an older adult um, is nearing the end of his or her life. So we're going to talk about hospice as kind of that last part of the care continuum here. And there are many misconceptions about hospice. So it's important for us as professionals to help families understand that hospice is not a place, it's a service. I hear that so often. Oh, so-and-so went to hospice. 
Well, uh, in some communities, there might be a facility that provides strictly hospice services. I know in my community, we have a facility called the Hospice House. And so some people choose to have hospice in that facility. But more often than not, the hospice services are brought to the older adult, whether that's in a residential home, an independent living facility, even assisted living or skilled facility. In a hospice, for an individual to go on to hospice, a physician order is needed. And the goals of hospice are to provide comfort through pain control, relieve physical, emotional, spiritual suffering, and to promote the dignity of the individual. And the topic of hospice can be very difficult for families to discuss. Oftentimes, older adults are only on hospice for a few days or weeks because the families are hesitant to utilize these types of services. However, a person will qualify if they have a life expectancy of six months or less. It's a really an underutilized service. Uh, it really is, hospice really is a wonderful service and can be import, an important source of support for the older adult and their family at the end of life and can provide great comfort to both the older adult and their family members. So now that we've talked about this vast continuum of care, and I'm sure this continuum will uh, evolve over time, especially as the boomers uh, start to continue to pass that 65-year and older threshold, we'll have new innovative ways uh, to care for older adults. I know that the technology piece is already working its way into all of the levels of the care continuum, uh, so that will continue to evolve and change. But Regardless of what um, the older adult, uh, what, where they land in the care continuum, there's always a question of who's going to pay for this? And I'm sure as professionals, you hear that all the time. So now we're going to transition into talking about uh, the cost of care, who pays for care, and so forth. Oftentimes, neither the older adult nor the adult children knows who will pay for care. They assume that Social Security, Medicare, or the parents' retirement accounts will pay for every, uh, every bit of the care that's needed. And the reality is that Social Security does not pay for long-term care costs. Medicare will cover a certain, certain care needs across the continuum, such as a skilled nursing, rehab stay, uh, possibly um, a small chunk of time for home care or home health care or hospice. Uh, but the day-to-day -day care um, or most housing options are not covered by Medicare. Another frustration is that the true cost of care is unknown or underestimated. It's really hard to predict how much care an older adult will need, especially in a best case or worst case scenario. And people are living longer, and unfortunately they have not properly saved, especially enough to cover their retirement and their long-term care needs. And finally, families are waiting to plan until it's too late uh, when a crisis has occurred. And again, that's usually when they come to us as professionals seeking our guidance. So I think something we can all agree on is that care, no matter really at what uh, point in the care continuum, it comes with a price tag. So let's look a little bit more at this cost of care. According to the Commission on Long-Term Care, about $450 billion is spent every year on long-term care costs. And the reality is the federal and state governments are footing about $130 billion of that cost through uh, Medicaid. So that means a large portion of these long-term care costs are falling on the older adult and their family. And another reality we're facing is 70% of Americans who reach the age of 65 will be unable to care for themselves without assistance at some point. And we know again with this wave of baby boomers, there's going to be a growing need for long-term care. And the price of care is not expected to decrease anytime soon and will likely continue to trend in an upward manner. So while it's hard to determine the exact cost of care, there is a Genworth study that uh, regularly evaluates the continuum of care and provides some nationwide averages. So I did want to share those with you on the next slide. And their most recent study was released in 2014, so these are already a little out of date, but they're a good starting point for us discussing with family. 
So as you can see on the screen, Genworth estimates that home care is about $19 an hour. Adult daycare charges at a daily rate. On average, it's about $65 a day. Assisted living facilities are typically paid for on a monthly basis, about $3,500 a month. And a skilled nursing facility charges a daily rate. And on average in the U.S., it's about $212 a day. And again, these are just averages. So in more highly dense populate, populated areas, those prices are likely to up to, uh, increase, and in some of the more rural areas, they might be a little bit less. Uh, but again, gives us a good starting point. And one part of the care continuum that really you cannot put a price on is that family care. And I do have a separate box for that up there because I think it's really important, especially with more and more family members chipping in to provide care. It really doesn't cost the care recipient anything, but it can have a toll on our family caregivers in terms of financial, emotional, and physical strain. So it's certainly something for us to be aware of and to bring up in conversation with uh, those families that we're talking with. So now we know a approximate cost of care, but what are the options to pay for long-term care services? As I mentioned earlier, a lot of people assume that the government, whether it's Medicare or Medicaid, will pick up the bill for these long-term care service, services. Studies and articles indicate that people have not even thought about who pays for care. So let's talk through the options. The first is self-insurance, which is just a fancy word for saying out-of-pocket or private pay. And a good portion of long-term care is paid privately. Next is long-term care insurance. And this is uh, a form of insurance that has become increasingly popular, but it is rapidly changing. And some of the earlier policies do not cover home care services or some don't cover assisted living facilities because they weren't even around when these policies are written. So it's very important for families to read through these policies and to ask a lot of questions of the insurance provider to make sure that they're fully understanding what is covered and what is not covered. And some insurance policies can be renegotiated to cover types of care that weren't really around when these policies were written. So again, something to look into. And insurance companies are also coming out with new products and offerings um, that are al alternatives to kind of a long-term care insurance. And one is called a medically underwritten annuity. So that's one that you can, I don't have a, a lot of time to dive into that today, uh, but it can help with these long-term care costs, especially for those who do not qualify for long-term care insurance. So regardless of any type of uh, long-term care insurance policy or financing option, it's important that we recommend that older adults and their families consult insurance and financial advisors, those professionals in those designated disciplines, to get the most accurate and up-to-date information. And we talked about Medicare and Medicaid, and I know many of you are probably familiar with these programs, but I just wanted to briefly go over them because oftentimes older adults and their families get confused by the two, and they're really unsure what they cover. So Medicare is deemed a health insurance plan for older adults, and it's available to them at the age of 65, but to qualify, they have to be a U.S. citizen or um, a legal immigrant, and they have to have been employed and had Social Security uh, or deducted from their, and Medicare deducted from a paycheck for at least 40 quarters, which equate to about 10 years, or have been employed through the railroad system. And Medicare was not really designed to pay for chronic conditions or long-term care, which is really what a lot of seniors are needing. Uh, they're more for those acute care episodes. For example, a short-term stay in a rehab facility or a short-term um, short uh, home health visits, those types of things. Now, Medicaid is a program, again, that's often confused with Medicare because they're both health care programs, but Medicaid is a means-based welfare program designed to help the poor or disabled of all ages, including the elderly. For those over the age of 65, it can help pay for nursing home costs once the older adult has exhausted all or most of their assets. And again, 
these two programs, Medicare and Medicaid, are far more complicated uh, than those just couple paragraph descriptions that I just read. So um, if you have a, a Medicare, Medicaid specialist in your area, um, talk to them about these different forms uh, of, of uh, program or about these two different programs, and MedicareRights.org is also a great resource uh, to learn more about that. But a final source of payment is uh, for long-term care insurance is Veterans Assistance or VA Assistance. So one in three seniors in our country are actually a veteran or a surviving spouse of a veteran. And most, more than likely, these veterans and their spouses are eligible for VA benefits, especially one called uh, Pension with Aid in Attendance. So I will, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you some resources, one specifically on where to send families to see if their loved one qualifies for this type of, type of veteran's assistance. So now that we've discussed some long-term ways to finance care, I wanted to outline some important questions that an older adult and their family should ask before choosing any one of these types of care and the funding sources that we've talked about. It's important to identify if, this, if the funding source fits the, the older adult's needs uh, and is within their financial means. Um, it's also important to get all of the questions answered and to bring in those professional advisors when needed. We also want to uh, make sure that once they choose the provider, they identify their contact within the organization uh, in case questions or concerns arise. We want to ensure that the family has done their due diligence and research to find out about the care provider. They can read online reviews, testimonials, they can talk to family and friends about service providers or facilities that they uh, have used or know, know about in their community. Specifically for nursing homes, there's nursing home compare websites where uh, you can check the different ratings, and I'm going to share that website with you in just a little bit. Um, but when we're going through these types of questions, uh, we want to, once we identify uh, the type of care that's needed for older adults, uh, we want to identify, does the funding source fit my needs? So does it align with, align with the care options that I'm needing? And when they're talking with these care providers, we want to make sure that they're able to answer all of the questions that the older adult and their families have. And also, um, they want to address any concerns that they have because, um, of course, when you talk about care of an older adult, uh, that's a very personal topic. So we want to make sure that if any concerns are there, that they are addressed. And then, uh, again, once they have a care provider chosen, we want to make sure that families have a contact within the organization and have an advocate. And again, we want to make sure families are doing their research and their due diligence with these different parts of the care continuum. Um, and then we also, as providers, uh, need to be doing our due diligence, again, to stay up to date on the different care providers in our community across the care continuum and to be able to offer resources to these families because again, oftentimes they are in crisis mode. They do not know where to turn. They don't even know the type of care that their loved one needs. So they really look to us as the experts to know, you know where to start, um, where to turn for that care and that assistance. So I know that I've covered a lot of information today, but I did want to leave you with some resources here on the next slide. I've talked quite a bit about uh, those adult day centers, those senior centers, um, home care, home health care, and oftentimes the area agencies on aging in your community are going to be a great resource to help find those types of services within your community. And you can search for your local area agency on aging, if you're unfamiliar, on n4a.org. You type in your zip code to find the AAA uh, closest to you, and then reach out to them for some more information on local services that could be provided to their loved one. For family caregivers, we talked a lot about that family care and how, that, how um, it can have emotional, physical, uh, 
financial strains. So a great resource to offer caregivers is caregiverstress.com. On there is lots of tools, resources on a variety of topics, uh, everything from Alzheimer's and dementia to um, navigating the difference between home care and home health care. Again, lots of great tools and resources on that site. And I talked about Nursing Home Compare. Uh, Medicare has a great website. It's seen, seen right there, medicare.gov slash nursing home compare. You can go on there and look at the ratings, the recent evaluations of different nursing homes in your area. Oftentimes, people will utilize a geriatric care manager to help their loved one navigate this complicated care continuum. And on aginglifecare.org, you can do a search to find by zip code, by city, by state, the geriatric care managers in your area. So if families want to um, have kind of one person designated to their loved one to really assess the whole situation, uh, to make recommendations for a plan of care, to help families navigate uh, complicated paperwork and so forth, sometimes hiring a geriatric care manager can be a great way to help families navigate. And uh, just one thing to note there is usually that is a service that families will have to pay for. So just wanted to add that. And then uh, veterans assistance. I mentioned that as a source um, to pay for long-term care. So caregiver.va.gov is a great place for caregivers to go. Um, and then that number right there is the great uh, number for them to call to see if their loved one qualifies for any aid in attendance or any other resources. A lot of times uh, they might qualify for respite care, especially if their loved one who is a veteran has Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. So again, some great resources there. Um, and I hope that these resources and this PowerPoint today um, can help you better support the families that you're working with in your local communities so that you can be a resource and a place to turn to in these times of crisis and hopefully also in these times of preparation and planning for older adults' long-term care needs. So with that, Steve, I'll turn it back to you for some questions. All right, thanks very much, Lakeland. Great presentation. Um, everyone, as you can see from the slide up there on your screen, it is time for the Q&A portion of today's webinar. So if you have any questions here for uh, what Lakeland has been talking about, now is the time to send them in. And uh, Lakeland, let's get to it right here. Um, okay, first question. I'm a social worker at an apartment for seniors, not assisted living. One of the biggest challenges I face is the disengagement of family. Most of our residents have little or no visitation from their family, and this causes many of them to become reclusive. Engaging them is difficult. Do you have any suggestions that would help me to work more effectively with our seniors? That is a really good question. Um, isolation and depression are very common among older adults. Um, so when you're talking about uh, situations where maybe family members aren't visiting as often, <clears throat> that can be really hard on an older adult. And like uh, this individual mentioned, you might see them um, kind of um, retreat or uh, they might not come to activities as often. Um, and, you know, every independent living is different. Uh, every situation is different. Um, and so many family members are busy with uh, maybe their own children, getting them to their own sporting events, and uh, they're working and busy. And especially if they're long distance, it can be a little bit difficult. Um, if, if this community has access to any sort of technology, I know there are a lot of great new up-and-coming technology systems out there that can really help with that engagement. I know one of them is called LifeLoop, um, and this is a, so, uh, a platform that integrates social media. Um, there's another platform called Life Share, uh, a great way for families to use technology to get engaged with that older adult if they physically can't be there. Um, and this might be something, this other, um, I'm about to mention another suggestion, you might have already tried this in your community, but creating family events. So on the social calendar, creating family events um, and inviting, sending an invitation to those families. Um, might be a good way to uh, get them involved in the different activities around the community. Um, and sometimes um, if you're noticing that an older adult hasn't come to any activities recently, um, it might be good to just 
stop by their apartment and uh, chat with them, see if there's been any change in their condition. Sometimes um, if an older adult is less mobile or maybe they had a fall or and maybe they injure or have a bruise or uh, injured uh, a knee, a foot, it might not be as mobile to get down to activities. Um, or maybe uh, it's time to introduce uh, an, an assistive walking device to help them get down uh, to those activities. So again, it kind of is very situational, uh, but if we can encourage families to come to social events or um, if technology is an option uh, for that family, it might help with that regu more regular communication. That's a really good question. All right, thanks, Lakeland. Um, next question here. Can you talk about uh, palliative, palliative options versus hospice? That's a great question, yes. So palliative care and hospice, they're um, oftentimes um, can be confused or sometimes um, palliative care uh, can be um, not it's not always a precursor to hospice but sometimes an individual might go on palliative care um, before going on to hospice care so the the goal of palliative care really is um, pain management and it doesn't necessarily mean that the the individual is at the end of life. So for example, if an individual has cancer and they're going through cancer treatment, maybe it's chemo, maybe it's radiation, they might be likely to go on to palliative care to help manage those symptoms that come along with the illness um, while they maintain their treatment. So um, they're still addressing the patient's physical, emotional, spiritual well-being um, and helping them um, through uh, the different medications that are involved with that pain control uh, and so forth. Um, hospice, however, um, hospice is, is usually um, a, a, a doctor will order hospice if the individual has six months to live or less. So. The difference there is, um, you know, if an individual has, again, I'll use the cancer example. Um, cancer, um, maybe the treatment isn't working, and the, the individual, um, the doctor, is estimating that they have six months or less to live. They might opt to go on to hospice. Likely they'll discontinue that chemotherapy, that radiation, but again, they'll still be addressing that physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being along the way. So um, really, they have a lot of similarities, um, and they can also differ in payment methods, which I won't get into because it can kind of get complicated, um, but um, that's one of the biggest uh, differentiators um, and with, I, I do an entire presentation on palliative versus hospice care so I could go on and on and I think that's actually on uh, the schedule for 2018 so if you see that on there next next year I hope that you tune in but uh, those are some of the some of the differentiators but that is a really good question because it can be confusing all right um, next question Lakeland uh, when do you really know that it's time to get assistance for a family member? Tough question. That is a tough question. Because it really does um, vary, um, you know, based, <clears throat> based on the individual and their living situation. Um, there, on caregiverstress.com, there is a home care solution guide. Um, and it has some really, um, great information on when home care might be needed, so some signs to look out for. Um, so really, we want to be focused on the, senior, the older adult's safety needs. So in a living environment, if you're noticing um, signs of unsafe, that the environment's no longer safe, maybe in the bathroom, um, if there is a towel bar rack that is kind of hanging because it's broken, it's likely because the older adult is maybe using that to pull themselves up off the toilet. Um, if the older adult is no longer eating regularly, you're seeing signs of them losing weight. 
that might be a key uh, indicator that an older adult needs some assistance at home. If personal hygiene has changed, you know, they once were um, always very put together, smelled wonderful, hair done nicely. Um, if it's a female, maybe she always put on makeup every day. If you're seeing a change in, in um, her appearance or if you're smelling bodily odors, um, maybe it's an incontinence issue or maybe they're afraid to shower because it's difficult to get in and out of the shower, that sort of thing. Um, spoiled food in the refrigerator. There's all kind of sorts of um, signs that you can look for. Um, but again, on, on caregiverstress.com, um, if you look, uh, search for the Home Care Solution Guide, that um, there's some great indicators on that guide of, you know, when is it time to get some assistance in the house for the older adult? Because at the end of the day, we want them to be able um, to meet their their goals and their wants. And for many of those, it is to stay at home. Um, so if, if we're noticing that their environment is no longer safe or they're not properly taking care of themselves or maybe they're needing a little more assistance, um, that's when we can bring in um, a little extra help to help them remain independent um, and help them remain safe in the environment that they desire to be in, which is more than likely going to be the home setting. So that's a great question. All right. Okay, uh, the next question here for you, Lakeland. Um, it seems like, as you were saying, uh, a lot of people are in serious crisis mode when they get to this point. Is there anything that we can do to speed up the process to avoid some of that um, crisis? That is a great question. You know, it really, again, it's so situational. That's what can be uh, kind of complicated and frustrating about um, these different crisis situations. Uh, but if we're able to um, communicate to the family um, and get kind of a, a holistic picture of, of the older adult situation, so uh, identifying do they have a long-term care policy? If so, getting on the phone, helping them figure out what um, type of care uh, that that policy covers. If they, um, you know, if they are a veteran, getting them in contact with the VA um, to hopefully speed up the process of looking into whether or not they qualify for care. Um, if we're able to identify, you know, which family members uh, are able to chip in, what are their strengths, what are um, what are they good at? Where could they jump in and help out in this situation? Um, if we have our um, referral contacts in place, um, that can also help to speed up the process. If you are, for instance, if you're going to refer um, to home care or home health and you have three organizations in your community that you um, know have quality care, uh, you know one of their representatives um, and you know that they're very responsive, and you can reach out to them and say, this individual needs, needs care, needs assistance. Um, oftentimes, having those relationships established, those referral, uh, referral providers established, um, can really help speed up the process. If you're able to give them a name, give them a phone number, and get those referrals to the family as quickly as possible, um, then that can, again, help speed up the process and help uh, get that older adult um, the assistance and care that they really need. So that is a great question. Um, I wish I had more time to dive in, it, dive into that, but again, it can be very situational. So getting uh, information from the family, from the older adult, and then getting them to those referrals as quickly as possible can help speed up the process. But that's a great question. All right, well, Lakeland, we have reached the end of our hour here, and unfortunately we're out of time, but I wanna thank you for another great presentation and for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Steve, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Have a great rest of the day.